But wait, there were others, in the shadows. A shamed minority in light blue were skulking off to some underground alternative, downcast and, against the glow and bustle of the swan's crow, apparently physically stunted, shrunken into their own scarves. Room to move, the crowd at the War Taz and Lions last weekend was hardly a bumper one. Photo, Oppy wouldn't call them a crow, more a remnant, and officially, Super Rugby hasn't yet called them a crowd. It's scarcely possible to find an official attendance for the Waratahs Lions match last Friday night, played simultaneously with the Swans match. What an embarrassing scheduling snafu that was. Observers put the Waratahs Lions attendance at around 10,000, which possibly means 8,000, perhaps rugby's modesty is being hidden under a fig leaf. It wouldn't need to be a big one. The headline was that the Waratahs, on the field, were nilled. Off the field, their code was also nilled. You see this kind of embarrassment at writers' festivals, Andy Griffiths in one room, a literary novelist in the next. Afterwards, their lines at the book signing desks are not pretty. It's brute commercial reality. Andy Griffiths sometimes sends patrons the other guy's way. The AFL isn't so generous. Ruggageddon, then? Has Sydney finally declared itself an AFL town? I've got to say, as someone who grew up playing rugby, I'd never have imagined a night like this. I've seen future, and it is, Melbourne, and it made me, to coin Donald Trump, sad. Very, very sad. Loading and then the roar of the AFL crowd brought me back to the invigorating present. Unpacking the figures, the picture for Super Rugby is even bleaker. The National Fox Tell ratings on the night had 300,000 viewers for Swans Adelaide against 57,000 for the Waratahs Lions. At another 584,000 nationally watching the AFL game on Channel 7. So, whereas the live AFL audience outnumbered Super Rugby by 4 or 5 to 1, the TV audience ratio was more than 15 to 1. AFL is not just winning in the grandstands, it's winning on the couch. It looks even worse for rugby when bandwagony factors are taken out. The Swans are going fairly well this season but are borderline premiership contenders, and were beaten by the Crows. Waratahs, meanwhile, had been enjoying something of an on-field revival after their dire 2017. Frugger people were going to get off their butts and attend a game, this was the night. No go. And you can't blame Israel Folau for this one, although he might have to look no further than Corinthians to see God's plan for Super Rugby. The decline of interest in Super Rugby over the past few years is well documented. The excision of the Western Force was meant, by some logic, to staunch the bleeding, but it only seems to have opened another vein. Rather than concentrate the depth of Australian rugby by 20%, the absence of the force seems to have drained the pool from both ends. The ludicrous Super Rugby draw, giving Australian teams the benefit of playing most of their games against each other, is fooling nobody. Rugby will presumably find some bottoming out point. It has too much support from the big end of town to disappear. Super Rugby, however, is fast coming to resemble the Sheffield Shield, a competition that is talked about and has some importance, but that fewer and fewer people watch. Cricket can survive that because of its hugely popular other formats. Can Rugby? Are the Wallabies a powerful enough shop window, over the long term, to stop the code from receding into its private school ghetto, a recondite physical activity like lacrosse or polo? It is quite possible to imagine a future where rugby is the game they play in other countries, a kind of gap year jollity for future lawyers and bankers, but not a serious professional code in Australia. I'm sure rugby has a plan to revitalize itself beyond its excellent startup renaming itself Rugby Australia and ordering new stationery. But a lot of the talk from the top seems as wishful as Raylene Castle's suggestion that Fallout could have been more positive about his message from the Bible about other people's sex lives. How can you be positive about your code heading down the gurgler? Pretend that, like the crowd figure from last Friday, it just didn't happen. The generational problem for rugby, unlike cricket, was illustrated just across the road on Friday. Rugby has a monstrous competitor. I don't know if the folk at the Waratahs match could hear the roars from the SCG, but it must have been a brutal and lonely exposure to the strength of a code that is well organized at grassroots level, set up like an invading army in its vast bureaucracy, spectacularly successful as a form of show business, and bent on destruction and domination. You can almost hear the AFL-osaurus, rugby, you have left a garlicky aftertaste, league, we are coming to eat you next. Loading another of the curious questions raised by this watershed moment, and the watershed has been repeating itself for a few years now, it wasn't just last Friday, is why, given the inexorable rise of the AFL, the NSW government is throwing so much money into the rectangulation of its stadiums. 
I don't want to step into the middle of someone else's fight here, but when the plan of rebuilding the Sydney football stadium and reconfiguring the Olympic Stadium is done, the Sydney Cricket Ground and Spotless Stadium will be left as the two biggest ovals in the city. This seems odd. The Giants will eventually pull more than 20,000 to regular season games and finals. Under the current plan, they will have to play those games at the home ground of their arch enemy. 30 years from now, when all those Aki kitties and AFL families are multi-generational Swans and Giants fans, where will they all go to watch a big match? Well may they ask what on earth the NSW government, circa 2018, was thinking when it took away an 80,000 capacity oval ground? Time for another rebuild. Loading you wonder if the course of history would be changed if those in power were out at Moore Park last Friday night. I mean really out, not in a corporate box and government car, but out in the bus queues for Central and Circular Key after the matches. So many AFL fans, so many Red Sharons, and ta ta tahs If it weren't for the terrible public transport connections, you'd have thought you were in Melbourne. Australia is changing. Ten years from now, according to demographers, Sydney won't even be the country's biggest city. In sporting terms, it will be one of Melbourne's northern satellites with a bunch of obsolete rectangles.